Hi, I'm Melissa. And I'm Candace. Welcome back to The Build Up, presented by Brown Harris Stevens, where we discuss the secrets of building wealth through real estate. Today, we're going to be discussing the hottest real estate markets in 2024, as well as speaking with one of the most influential women in media, who's also an avid real estate investor, Nellie Galan. All right. Well, speaking about hot real estate markets. We just came back from Nashville, which was was really fun. (laughs) So fun. Loved the music and Mm -hmm. the whole scene there was just so much fun. Um, But it wasn't all for play. We also did some work while we were there. It was so nice of our previous podcast guest, Avery Williamson, to invite us to see all of his exciting real estate projects that he's working on. It's always really great to see it in person, right? Because we talked about it so much, but um, seeing it, it was really impressive. You know, we talk with our guests for so long about all of their things. And so it's really cool to, like you said, go and see them in yeah. person. Although his projects are about two hours outside of Nashville. So that was a long drive. It was nice though. Yeah, it was nice. And um, what was really cool is we got to go to Jackson and see what's happening there, which is a city that he's investing in. And it's also being revitalized because it's very close to the new Ford Blue Oval um, plant. So it's an area that's really booming. And that was really great to see that opportunity. Yeah, um, you know, that plant, it's going to also bring in a lot of jobs, right? I think over um, 30,000 jobs are saying that it's going to create, which is great, but also that's going to have a huge demand for housing. Yeah, and I think they're building, Ford is building their electric truck there Mm -hmm. at this new facility. So it's um, definitely one of those opportunities where you can see there's going to be a lot of growth, a lot of need for more housing. And so Avery's definitely investing uh, in the right time um, and right place. Um, But, you know, Jackson and and that whole Western Tennessee is not the only place that we're tracking. Zillow recently put out a report that's outlining the top 10 markets to kind of be on the lookout for this year. And um, that's always something that we get lots of questions about. So it's really interesting. Yeah. So who was top of list? (laughs) So Buffalo, New York was number one. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't expect that either. But yeah, Buffalo is number one. And then Ohio and Florida both had a number of cities within uh, within their state Mm -hmm. that were made the list. So um, and then there was a few other places as well. Did um, Tennessee make the list? No, unfortunately. They That's did. <laughs> interesting because of all we just said, right? So I'm sure, um, I'm not sure how they kind of measure that. Yeah, they do it based on looking at home value appreciation is one of the biggest metrics, as well as how long homes are sitting on the market is always a really good indicator of mm-hmm. the strength of that real estate market, as well as comparing, you know, job growth next to housing inventory and supply. And so, you know, it's basic economics, you know, supply and demand. Mm-hmm. So all of those markets are the ones that, um, uh, that ranked very well based on those metrics. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. And, you know, time and time again, we get asked a lot of times that, okay, what is the next city? Where should I invest in? And I think, you know, following that, that's it's not really that difficult. If you do a little bit of research, you can really see what cities you need to invest in. Yeah, of course, we never want to overly simplify it, but these are really good indicators to look for when you're exploring which market you may want to invest in, that, to have the greatest growth potential at least. But what about markets that are cooling off and where we should avoid? Yeah, there's a number of markets that have seen a boom over the past few years and are now starting to cool down just because, again, pricing had gone up too high where then the market could no longer absorb it. Those markets were places like San Antonio, Denver, Houston, Minneapolis, and New Orleans. So what was the main reason for this cooling off? The main reason was affordability. You know, that's, you know, they had a lot of growth and it reached a point where then the market couldn't absorb that that price point that it had hit. So now that we're starting to see a decline in those markets. Well, that makes sense, right? These markets have been growing at a rapid speed. So it does make sense that it's now um, tapering off, but we're going to be looking at at both the growth and the cooling off market so we can really be um, prepared. Yeah. We have a very special guest today. She is the first Latina president of a U.S. TV network, Telemundo. She's an Emmy award-winning producer, the founder of the nonprofit Adelante, and a New York Times best-selling author. Nelly, welcome to The Build Up. Oh my God, I'm so excited to be on The Build Up. I love the name of your show. (laughs) <laughs> oh, thank you. And we're very excited to share your very inspiring story. Um, but before we get into all of that, I think we're going to take it all the way back. You came to the U.S. as an immigrant from Cuba, yes. right? Yes. So yes. tell us about that experience. Well, you know, I think it's very timely right now because we see everything that's going on in the world. 
And I think that when you grow up in the United States, you know, I, I think of my son, of, of you ladies, you don't think that something horrible could happen. And from one day to the next, you'd have to leave your country, go live in a foreign country, speak a new language. And in my case, I was five years old. So my parents were like in shock uh, and they hung out and hung out and tried in a communist regime to stay in Cuba. And at one point it got so bad, like what we're seeing today happen in, you know, Iran and in Israel and, in, you know, Gaza and, you know, all, all over the world. I mean, six months ago, there was a civil war in Peru. I mean, it's happening all over the world. And I was born into a really like a country that was really happy and very like, it was kind of like the cool place for Americans to go. And it was very prosperous. And in a very short period of time, everything went haywire and we had to move to this country. And I end up uh, with two parents that don't speak English, who had their own house, a college education, uh, really great jobs. And they both have to go work in factories and they don't speak English. And it's very interesting because now I'm, I'm right now living in Miami. And every time I get in an Uber, I have an immigrant like driver who's like, I'm from Venezuela. And I go, well, what did you do in Venezuela? I was a brain surgeon and now I lost my career. I can't, you know, I'd have to start all over again. And so I have to drive an Uber and it's, it's, it's so, I'm so distraught and I've been offered jobs to be like a page in a hospital, but how can I be a page in a hospital when I used to be a brain surgeon? So I think it's a beautiful thing to talk about because in a weird way, we're kind of spoiled and entitled and we don't believe really that bad things could happen to good people because it's really never happened to us in so many generations, right? But it happens every day of the, the of life to millions of people around the world and how painful that is and how painful it was for me to at five years old really have to be the grown up in the relationship and have to be the translator and the parent and worry about, are my parents okay? Are they depressed? And like, as time passed on, uh, hearing them say, we don't have enough money and what are we gonna do? And we don't know the system in this country. And maybe that's why I'm so committed to helping you know, women and especially minority women, because I know what it is to go through that, you know? Exactly. And I can really relate to your story because I myself am, am an immigrant. I came here when I was 16. And also my dad had a really good job. You know, he had a master's and he had to also work in a factory when he came here. Right. I feel like that's the whole sort of process we all go through as immigrants when we come here and really paved away. And, you know, um, I didn't come from, you know, a really stressful situation and such as what's going on in the world. But we came here for the American dream. Right. Right? That's why our parents came and my parents came. And for for me, I also really relate and just really doing something for that, that a sort of community, right? And financial literacy that we are all very passionate about has been a huge part of that. And I myself, am, I'm not an immigrant. I was born here, but I'm first generation. So I can very much relate as well. And one thing that Melissa and I talk a lot about is the immigrant mentality. And we think it has some pros and some cons, like everything in life. But for you, how did your immigrant mentality help you and hurt you as you built your career and as a person? It's a great question. I think that from a career point of view, it only helped me because immigrants are grateful. They're patriotic. Uh, they, that you're told that you have to work. I don't care if you work 20 jobs, nobody feels sorry for you. And you also learn to be in a team. When you are in a family and your family has lost everything, you are in it together. And there's something very beautiful about that that has really worked for me, whether I'm making a TV show, whether I'm running a corporation, whether I'm running my own business, I know how to work in a team. And, uh, and I also know not to feel like, uh, you know, kind of sorry for myself for very long because I understand that life is not easy. Life is a roller coaster ride and you, it doesn't get better as you get older, by the way. It's just a different set of roller coasters, right? So, uh, it does, it has given me also the fire in the belly that most people are missing. You know, everybody thinks I'm really tough on my kid. 
uh, because I like I make him do things, you know, like my kids had it easy compared to me. Right. So when he finished college, I said, you know, I own a lot of buildings and I could drop dead tomorrow and you've got to just get in there and learn the buildings. Even if you do something else, you have got to be a real estate person because tough, you know, too bad. And this summer I was on vacation. I took, I finally went on vacation and he calls me and he goes, uh, you know, the building just like a pipe blew up and it's, you know, pouring water. And I said, I'm dead, figure it out. And I hung up on him. And the people <laughs> I, like I was that. with are like, my God, who did you say that to? And I said, my kid. And they go, God, that's a little much. And I said, no, he's got to learn that like everything is fixable, figure it out. We've, you know, like younger people have been handed everything and don't realize like the stuff you have to do, like people that come here that have to have three jobs, make money, go to school, have, you know, and you get handed, uh, you know, to go to school by your parents. So that, that mindset has given me the grit to not only have my career, but have it ahead of schedule. <laughs> like I'm way ahead, you know, now the bad, I'll t you asked me the bad part. The bad part is that when you're 12 years old and you're selling Avon in school to help pay for your school and you're protecting your parents so they don't feel bad about it, you stop being a child. And not to get too ahead of myself, but many, many, many years later, after I've been very successful, I, I went back to school after I had made money and everything. And I went back to school, not because I needed a degree, but because I felt like something was wrong. And what it was is that I missed so many markers in my life. Like I missed my high school graduation because I, I finished a year and a half early. I missed, you know, uh, dating guys and going to college. I missed all those things. And as, as a result, I was like super old in career years and super wise. And I think super immature in my personal life. Dating like bad boys when I don't even drink or smoke, you know, like just really like an idiot. Like I was 17 years old in, in personal years and like 80 years old in wisdom years, you know? So I had to stop for a moment, go back to school. I got a doctorate in psychology. I really got to therapize my, I had, to, I got, I had a lot of therapy myself and I worked in a school uh, giving therapy to kids for a year, which was very humbling and grounding for me. And I think becoming more congruent later in life. It's very it's fascinating, fun. you know, just to hear you, how open you are about that, because I think it's hard to acknowledge those things and to get to that place where you're like, I need to, you know, work on these areas. But you're clearly someone who's always trying to be the best version of herself, whether it's professionally or personally. So, you know, we give you a lot of credit for all of that work you did on yourself a little bit later in life. Um, and that kind of segues to one thing that you talk a lot about that Melissa and I also talk a lot about. I, I don't know if it's just us having being like minded or if it's an immigrant thing but you know we always talk about you know success is not overnight and it really takes time and you know people look us up or look you up and they're like wow she was the president of Telemundo and you know she's done so many things but you started as an unpaid intern and that's the thing that we see a lot is people want to skip steps and they want what we have and you have and you know they don't know what it was like for us making our way in our industry, but we're not here to talk about us. We're here to talk about you. And so I think that those stories are so important. And if you can share a little bit about how you went from an unpaid intern to what now everybody knows you as, as a successful self-made woman. Well, I think you could never, I mean, even today, and I'm, you know, way, way, way older. Uh, a friend of mine called me recently and said to me, do you want to be my intern? Uh, and I was like, I was kind of excited because I knew what he meant. He was mastering at the time crypto. And he's like, I feel like you really need to learn this. And you've got to just sit on a lot of calls with me and learn it. And it made it kind of exhilarated me because I think you can never for stop wanting to be an intern. And, you know, I, I really believe that. I think there's something beautiful when you're an intern and you're working for free which for some people, I feel bad that some people can't do it because they can't afford to do it. But I don't care if you have to have three other jobs to be an intern. There's something great about doing something for free and people give you a lot of slack because you're working for free. And they, it's almost like you're like part of the wall. They think you're not really there. 
And it's your moment to listen to every conversation, to every once in a while when you feel brave, ask a question, listen to phone calls when people really don't think you're that, you're, you know, you don't matter because you're the intern. It's tell people you're willing to drive them because in the car you hear their conversations and that's where all learning is. And I guess for me, I started out as an intern and I think my, my strategy was always, I'm going to be indispensable. I'm just going to make myself indispensable. Like I'm the best, like shitty person that does everything for you. So you can't like, you, like you miss me. Right. And so when, when that came about and I did that, you know, everybody says to me, how did you learn so much about money? I did not go to school until many years later. I did not go to business school. I didn't go nothing. And I learned because I, I have worked for eight billionaires. My persona was I'm the dependable straight laced one. As a result, a lot of bosses that I had treated me like the good daughter they never had instead of the chick they want to sleep with. And I think that all of those things added up to, honestly, I kept getting more jobs and more jobs, and more jobs maybe even ahead of schedule because I was so pretty two shoes and dependable that in a way it really helped me. And I, and so I look at that as the combination of my immigrant work, like ethic, but also my parents' value system that was very old fashioned and straight laced that I used for myself. Now, I think probably where I didn't use it is in my own personal life dating men, but I was, but it was almost like I had very split lives. I never went out with people I worked with. Like I never did anything like, and, 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 and honestly, that's why I, when I went back to school, I thought I am so different in my personal life than in my business life. If I could only be in my personal life, the way I am in my business life, I'd be the perfect person. So it took me a while to figure all that out. But I think it is about constantly taking, you know, taking look, taking a look inside of you at like, what are the things that are going right? What are the common denominators that obviously are bringing you success? And what, where are the areas that you're weak and being honest with yourself that it's not somebody did that to you, that when you keep having the same problem three or four times, there's something you've got to fix. Right. And that's just being really self-aware, right? Just mentally, right. right. right? That's a big part of success. Um, and I do think that you speak very well about just building your brand. And I do think that that's super important. The fact that like you were able to realize that, okay, I'm going to build this persona and that's really your brand and every entrepreneur needs that. Right. And now you're a successful TV producer. You're the peak of your career. Um, but, you know, we saw that you really were or are a big advocate for investing in real estate, right? So yes. what made you want to uh, invest in real estate? A lot of people get overwhelmed, especially they don't know the process and they go to the stock market, which is very easy, but you chose real estate. Well, this is where me being on, uh, you know, driving somebody or I, I think in specifically, I'm going to tell you, I think the day that I had the aha about real estate, I was working for Rupert Murdoch early in Rupert Murdoch's uh, entree into the United States when he bought Fox. And I was launching his channels in Latin America. And, you know, I, I got to be with him a lot uh, when later on, I you know, to this day, now I can't even call him because he's so protected. But back then he was really like, you know, an entrepreneur coming to America. And I remember being on in a car with him and he kept doing real estate deals, trying to buy more buildings to make the Fox lot bigger. And I really never really heard him be that excited about the, t the TV shows or the movies of, at Fox. And I was like, you know, it seems like you're more interested in the, in the buildings than in the TV shows. And he goes, young lady, you know, I can't do an Australian accent, but young lady, the buildings that the business is in will eventually be worth more than all the shows, than all the content. And, and that like kind of freaked me out. I was like, wow. And then I had another boss 
who was also like, you know, multi, at the time a multimillionaire and he later on became a billionaire. And he said to me, when you grow up and you make money, you know, he goes, you gotta, you gotta make money while you sleep. And I was like, what, what the heck is he saying? I don't even know. And you know, now I know that it means that you have to make money, save money, invest the money. And then while you're sleeping, invest in something that grows. And he said, don't buy bling, buy buildings. And, um, and, and also I noticed how they did it, right? Like I noticed that like, you know, Rupert Murdoch came to America. He didn't really know anything about real estate in America. And he hires a guy. He finds out who's the guy that's going to know about commercial buildings. And he like spends a lot of time with them. And that's the other thing I, I learned from all these people. Like they're also constantly learning, right? And they're not afraid to say, I don't know. You know, right now I'm on the board of a company with an, a brilliant entrepreneur and he's in the middle of buying his first house because he's a founder that had no money, you know, and, and the way he's gone about buying his first house, I find it so masterful to watch him because he's kind of learning as he's doing because he asks so many questions and he treats it like it's a tech startup buying a house, <laughs> you know, and I think that's, and for me, how I did it is I started going to open houses every Sunday. And I started asking a lot of questions like, what are, you know, what are houses like? What are, what? And the reason I started buying commercial buildings is because one of my bosses said to me, you're a nice girl. Don't buy residential, buy commercial. Because if you buy commercial and you don't buy huge buildings, you buy buildings where it's a one tenant building. I said, you'll get a corporation in there. And then if something goes wrong, the corporation will pay you. You're so nice that if you do a residential and those poor people go broke, you're not going to want to kick them out because you're an immigrant and you're going to feel bad for them. So don't go into residential, go into commercial. And if I had to do my life over again, I would not buy one residential anything. Even though right now commercial is tough, I would still go that way because I think he was right. For me specifically, I've had some problems with my commercial buildings during the pandemic and I had no problem getting a lawyer and fighting them because it was a huge company. And it is different when you're an immigrant and you're buying residential and if bad things happen to people, you feel sorry for it. It's more emotional. It's true. It's true. Yeah. That was good advice you got. Um, but can you share a little bit about your first real estate deal? You refer to it as the Venice dump. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about this deal. Well, I mean, I, I, I've had I've had a few kind of at the same time that were in the sim, in a similar thing, but I actually think the first first thing I bought, which I highly recommend, is I bought a an apartment, which I later gave to my parents, by the way, but an, an apartment that was in pre construction, and I think that's a great way to go for a young person, because as you ladies know, you buy something in pre construction, and if you do your homework. Uh, you put a down payment and then it might take them another year or two to build that apartment. And by the time you build the apartment, the apartment is worth more. So you can flip it. And I th actually, that's not the one I gave to my parents. So what I did is I bought a couple of uh, build, you know, apartments in pre-construction. By the time they were built, I flipped them and made some money. I kept 1031 exchanging all this money. For those of you that don't know, that's I'm very, you know, that's my next book is on taxes. The tax law that allows you to roll over the, the proceeds tax-free into another property. So I kept doing that. At some point, I bought my parents an apartment in Miami because they were retiring. But the, the Venice dump that you're talking about is I had done a couple of those 1031s where I never lived in the building, never owned, the, you know, I just kept flipping money till I had a chunk of money. And I was working at the Fox lot uh, under Rupert Murdoch. And he's like, I'm going to give you some office space. And I was so excited. And my whole team was so excited. They were like, we're on the Fox lot. We're seeing movie stars and directors every day. And then like the first month or after the second month I was there, I get a bill for $40,000 as rent. And I go, hell no. And I tell everybody, what is the dumpiest place in LA? I had just moved to LA what is the dumpiest place in LA to live? And they all said, Venice. I go, okay, 
I'm going to go live in Venice and buy a house, buy a building in Venice. And I went and found this building and I'll never forget one of my employees said to me, you're going to go broke. Don't buy a building. You're just, you're, it's too much. You're going to go broke. And I go, no. And, and then, okay. And then I am like, mute me because I bought this little building for $700,000. That was a 10,000 square foot building in Venice in the middle of gangs. And I go, I'm Latina. I can deal with gangs. I'll, I'll figure it out. We moved to the building and my entire team says, we're going to quit because what we loved about working with you is that we got to be on the box lot. And I said, listen, that is Rupert Murdoch's brand. That is not my brand. I am not paying Rupert Murdoch $40,000 a month when I can buy my own building. And by the way, I bought that building with very little down and even with a, with, with taxes at the time that were, I mean, not taxes, interest, the interest on the money was eight and a half percent, which back then was like insane. I was paying 14,000 a month, not $40,000 a month. And today that building is worth $20 million. Do you still own it? <laughs> I still own it and it rents for quite a lot of money. Amazing. I love that. Yes, definitely. And you spoke about, um, you know, emerging markets. It looks that you have a knack for that, right? So what cities are you looking at currently for the next emerging markets? Well, I think it's, it's emerging cities, emerging businesses, emerging markets. It's emerging everything. And then who, who is your customer in America is emerging as well. You know, I did a, I did a whole, uh, I did an event last week with Damon John and we were with a lot of entrepreneurs and I was saying to them, you know, if you're not focused on your customer being emerging and that the number one, for instance, buyers in America are Latina women and following them are black women, you should know that. So that's an emerging customer, right? And then emerging business is what are the, you know, don't pick a business of the past, pick a business of the future. Like I would not tell you ladies right now, go do TV as a producer, as an owner of content, because if you sell to Netflix or any of these streamers, you have to sell them all rights. In the days when I was doing TV shows and I was doing hundreds of TV shows, I got to own the back end of the TV show. So you would maybe break even in the United States, maybe even make a little profit. And then every time you sold your content around the world, you made money. You made money while you slept. In today's world, that's not a great business. Now, if you want to do it for, for your ego or, or as a commercial for your brand, that's okay. But don't do it thinking you're going to get wealthy making TV shows. You're not. So pick a business that is going to make you wealthy in 20 years. You should have, you know, all businesses should have a lifespan of at least, you know, you should think in 20 year increments, a building you know, kind of should peak out in 20 years um, and then maybe go down a little and maybe then go back up. And the same thing with businesses, you should pick something that's on its way up, not on its way down. So I look at, and then I look at cities, right? I moved to Miami right now because my parents are, are old and I want to help them. And I'm lucky because I bought real estate here at the low end of Miami. I wouldn't move here right now if at the highest moment of Miami. That's crazy. I would be moving to Idaho, South Carolina, Arkansas, the places where you could still in 20 years become rich. Right. I love that mentality. And a lot of people lack that, right? They try to be where it's the highest paying rent, like here in New York City. And I think for people who are looking to invest in real estate, they often get very overwhelmed, right? And thinking they need this large down payment, but um, they need to really budget. And a lot of people find it very hard to do that, especially when they're used to a certain lifestyle. So we really do appreciate your take on that. And, you know, for us, it, it seems this conversation is very inspiring, you know, just every Thing that you've been doing, especially for women in just really having them invest their money, especially in real estate to build wealth. And that really resonates with us because we did form an organization called Tower, the organization for women and by, by women in real estate. And for that, you, you know, we have these podcasts, we go out, we talk to, to women just how to invest in real estate. So, and you founded Adelante. So can you talk to us a little bit about its mission? Well, I found it out Adelante because I felt like, obviously I'm Latina 
And I felt like it was my duty to give back to my own community first. And I felt like we were way behind everybody else. I think um, so many, like when I left home, my parents freaked out. And I've, I've heard so many Latinas say, I got a scholarship to a college and my parents didn't let me go. And I just felt like so guilty that I had to stay here or I didn't start a business because I, ha and I get it. So, but I left, I left and I did it. And now my parents are like, well, if you hadn't left, we wouldn't have money in old age. Right. So I want, I want women to hear that, you know, I started that as a, you know, as a way of really doing remedial teaching in a way to Latinas. And then I started inviting other women, you know, of other cultures, immigrants, uh, African-American women, Asian women, South Asian women, women that come here from other countries, because I also realize it's important that we all buy from each other and that we all do business together, that you don't just marginalize yourself in your own community. But what I want women to hear more than anything is, you know, I am now much older. When I was 30, you know, I had all the, I had a peer group of friends that we were all coming up. And now that we're all older, they all say to me, did you just make way more money than me? And I say, no, but when we were 30, I was living beneath my means and sacrificing because sacrifices, sacrificing isn't suffering. It's sacrificing for something greater than yourself. And while you were buying a Jaguar and going to Europe and spending a lot of money, I was living beneath my means with a car that was 10 years old and I was buying buildings. And I didn't know anything about real estate. And at 31, I bought my first little flipper pre-construction. And by 45, I had bought 16 buildings and I could retire. So it's not the end. It's not brain surgery here. We can figure this out. And I can tell you, and I, I want all you young women to hear this, that when you're young, you can get away with going to Europe on a hundred dollars a day. And like, you know, you can, you can just like really slum it and nobody's going to judge you. And in fact, they're going to think you're cool. But when you're older, if you have like, if you used up all your money and you get to older age and you're broke, it's, it's really a bad end of your life. And when you're older and you have the money, not just to do finally get the car you want, go on trips that you want, do all that stuff. But besides that, choose whatever the hell you want to do. And that is really why we're doing it. It's not to be grandiose. I'm not grandiose. I don't like, I'm not into like grandiose things, but what I am into is freedom to choose. Freedom to not be in a relationship I don't want to be in. Freedom to not work for somebody I don't want to do. Freedom to not do a project I don't want to do. And freedom to decide I want to do something new and I can afford to take that risk. Right. Freedom is power. And that's much harder to not be able to do in older age than when you're young. So it's better to sacrifice when you're young because I'm just going to tell you, I can tell you what the other side looks like when it's not, when you haven't figured it out. Right. Definitely. Yeah, we relate very much to that. And, um, you know, you talk also a lot about ways that women and others can invest besides real estate. So what are some of the other avenues that you recommend to people looking to build that financial independence? I think it's very important. Like people talk about diversifying your portfolio. I would say diversify your assets, right? Like everything, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. Like I think that I was very lucky because I had some African-American friends that were celebrities and early on they were like buying black art. And they said to me, you need to buy Latino art now that it's like, it's, it's, you could pay nothing for it. And I was like, really? I, you know, whatever. And they're like, yeah, buy things you really like and put them in your house. And like, some of them will be worth nothing, but you'll see somebody's going to hit. And boy, were they right. They were right. And I didn't realize that the art world was going to take off. None of us could have also predicted that the art world would trade in so much crypto, for instance, and that you have a whole other asset class that you can do a lot with. And that also helps you with your taxes because you can loan art to a museum. And first of all, it grows in value when that happens. And also you get write-offs for doing that. So, and you can also like, let's say as you get older and you're, you're wealthier, you can also give away a piece of art 
to a museum and you can get a huge tax write-off. So there's a lot of assets that are also helpful. And I think that leads me to the next thing I've really learned, which is taxes and which is going to be my next book. I think that what taxes teach you is to diversify what you invest in and because different things get different at different times, get different uh, incentives from the government. So, uh, you know, like if, if this country needs oil, for instance, they would, they would give you a huge tax incentive for investing in oil. And that's something that, that you can get a dividend off of. Like, in other words, investing in an oil, in oil, and, I, and when I mean oil, I don't mean paper oil, I mean actually a rig that's pulling out oil, then that's like investing in real estate because they pay you as the oil comes out and the government writes it off because they need more people investing in oil. Other times it's solar energy. Other times it's, you know, whatever. The government invests in things and if you follow their lead, you get the ultimate tax write-offs and then you can use that money that you get back to buy more assets, more buildings, more this, more that. So, you know, it is it is really like I, I really recommend everybody start with Monopoly, the game. It really t- teaches you a lot. I love Robert Kiyosaki's game that he did that is about buying properties as well. It's a little deeper than Monopoly. I think that like thinking about thinking like a gamer in a weird way actually helps you in wealth building because it is like that, right? It's kind of like pieces in a puzzle and you go, okay, now how can I get the best bang for my buck with with all these pieces? And when is the right time to sell? When is the right time to buy? And what do I do? You know, it's kind of fun. And if you think of it that way, you really, you really can hack the system. Absolutely. And you've been dropping a lot of gold nuggets here in in terms of advice throughout the whole episode, but we're interested to learn what was the best advice you've gotten along your career. I'll tell you one that you haven't heard yet. I think, you know, I've been very blessed because I've been in an emerging, you know, I was in Latino TV in the very beginning. I was employee one. And as my boss said to me, I was like, I, you know, I was at the time I was a CBS young correspondent. And I, I thought I had envisioned myself being Diane Sawyer. I was going to be like some, you know, whatever. I bet Savannah got three or something. And then I meet these, I meet this, these people that were buying a Spanish TV station and they were like, you should come and work for us. And I go, ew, I don't want to work in Spanish TV. That's like my parents. Ugh. I want to go work at, I'm, I'm working at CBS. I'm fully legit. I'm going to be like a major anchor woman. And the guy said to me, that sounds like a factory worker to me. He's like, you mean to tell me that you're, you talk, you're talking to two guys who are multi, multi, multi millionaires and we're going to give you, you're going to be employee one. Like if you're the dumbest person on earth, you're going to be rich because this is an emerging business and it's going to be a multi-billion dollar business and you're employee one. And I don't think that my kid would have chosen that because he's too, he's lived such a good life that he would pick, he'd pick the sexy job. And I picked working for two multimillionaires that both became billionaires. And I was right because you should do, you should follow people jobs. And I followed those people in an emerging business and they were right. When you're the first person to something, the first to something, you're going to do really well. Now, the other thing I've learned is that if you're the second or third or fourth or even fifth to an industry, you're still going to do really well and with a lot less headaches because the person who's the number one person is going to pioneer for everybody else and go through all the heartaches and learn all the lessons. The other people are going to see what you did wrong and do it better and they're going to make more money with less. So I would say that for me to start out and be first to market was really good. Now I have zero desire to be first to market. I'm happy to be third, fourth, or fifth. How's that? How's that? (laughs) We love it. We love it. Yes. Her takeaway is be second in life. (laughs) (laughs) Learn from the first person's mistakes and do it. The, The example I give everybody is look at American Idol and look at the voice. American Idol was first. The voice has made 20 times the money. And 
these people are now on a streamer and these people are still on TV. Well, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much, Nali. This was wonderful speaking with you. The ladies are the best. Uh, can't the wait. I can't wait to have you on my podcast. Yeah, I know. Definitely. Coming on soon. soon. And when you come to New York, hopefully we can get you in the studio. Oh, my God. I would love it. I yes. would love it. I would love it. <laughs> so, I'm so glad you're both thinking this way and that you're helping so many people think this way, too, because it's so important. Couldn't agree more. Agree, yes. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nelly, for joining us today. We so enjoyed learning about your journey, as well as how you're championing for women to reach their own financial freedom. It was such a great discussion. She definitely left a lasting impression. Today's episode is presented by Brown Hair Stevens. And as always, you can find us at Tower on Instagram, as well as Tower.com. See you next week.